Good morning, everybody. Did you watch TV last night? Then you know it's about time to make the energy transition happen. Today, we gather to dig a bit deeper into the needs of research, technology, development, and innovation for the energy transition to happen. We share with you how the joint programming platform Aeronet Smart Energy Systems deals with that challenge, what we have achieved, and how we will proceed. Me, I'm Ludwig Karg, your moderator for this morning, as I'm also leading the JPP SCS support team. I know quite a bit about the JPP SCS, but there is definitely a person who knows way more than me. That's Michael Hübner. Michael is waiting. Michael is coming on stage. Welcome, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Our valued coordinator. Michael, it's your turn to explain what is JPP SES, what has it been, what is it, and what will it be? Your turn, Michael. Thank you, Ludwig, for this kind introduction. Yeah. Seven years ago or eight years ago, JPP SES was just an idea and just a vision. Um, and over the years, it has become a network of more than 30 funding partners, public, public funders, um, that together um, initiate and fund transnational projects. The goal of this joint programming platform is to um, work on the integration of energy systems. So it's not on single technologies, it's on the system integration aspects. And the goal is to organize the learning from the very regional and local level uh, of the participating countries up to the European level and up to the European knowledge base. We had found out that it is very important to link the national programs and the national projects with the European level, particularly when it becomes uh, or when, it, when we talk about system integration, because at the end, we want one integrated, renewable and sustainable European energy system. That's also why we are not only talking technology, as you see here on the right side, we are also talking about other layers of knowledge, like marketplace um, and adoption. More of this will be part of the discussion, I think, afterwards. And we have developed three fifths in this platform. One was on smart grids. That was the, sp the starting one. Then on integrated regional energy systems. And uh, the latest one is digital transformation of the energy system. Three very important aspects when we want to uh, meet the challenge of integrating the energy system. Over the years, we have developed a number of joint calls for uh, research, development, and innovation projects that we are funding. Um, each year from 2015 on, we have uh, managed to launch a call. On the right side of this slide, you see the different topics or focus areas that these calls were concentrating on. In the last call, 2021, we even managed to do a collaborative activity with another Aeronet, the Ge Geothermica Aeronet, on renewable heating and cooling solutions. So that was already the first joint activity of different Aeronets in the energy field. More than 100 projects have been funded so far and are up and running uh, and part of the huge knowledge community that we are building. Um, and you see here also on the left side that we are not only intending to fund projects, but we want to do more. We want to build a knowledge community together with these projects and we created an impact network to make sure that the research and innovation projects are meeting their need owners as soon as possible and get into the market as quick as possible. In order to link to the European level, um, the set plan action four is one very important and central link to the set plan and to the European level. There is the bridge initiative of the of all the European projects that our knowledge community is linking to. There's the set plan implementation working group where the member states are working together to identify joint activities that are then uh, implemented in the Ernet and in the platform. We have 
a collaboration, strong collaboration with the European Technology and Innovation Platform, Smart Networks for the Energy Transition, um, and are working closely together in uh, also um, using their roadmaps for uh, defining our joint cause. Um, beyond Europe, we also try to establish via the Mission Innovation Network collaborations with countries that are non-European countries, because we see, of course, that the energy transition is happening globally and the technology value chains are becoming more and more global value chains. So it's very important also to collaborate um, with these countries. And it's a great opportunity that we have our joint programming platform where we can also establish the collaboration with these countries because it's for many countries very challenging to establish one-to-one -one, uh, relationships and collaborations which, with, with a huge number of countries. That's the reason or that's the big opportunity that we are getting with this um, collaboration platform where we can manage all these collaborations. At the moment, we are working uh, to establish an even larger collaboration platform, joint programming platform, that is the Clean Energy Transition Partnership. In this partnership, our Aeronet, our joint programming platform, but also all the other Aeronets that have been working in the last uh, 20 years in the energy field in Europe are gathering in one big initiative. More than 50 fun funding partners, public funding partners are working here um, together from nearly all European countries and the first joint call has been launched lately in September and is now open for projects. This new platform has, is covering not only the topics of um, system integration, but really a broad variety um, of all energy technology relevant topics to um, provide innovation for the energy transition in Europe that reaches from power technology over storage and fuels to heating and cooling solutions, but also some integration topics. And you see here the European energy infrastructure that is a lot related with smart grids and the integrated energy system um, and integrated regional energy systems. These are key areas where our platform, the Smart Energy System Aeronet, is feeding into and where we will join the forces in the next years um, and the Aeronet platform become, will become more and more a part of this new uh, huge platform, the partnership. Now for our discussions, and this is um, a little bit of motivation for our policy conference. Um, why are we doing this conference every year? Uh, of course, we want to show results from all of our projects and initiatives. And the first part of policy conference is always trying to highlight important topics that we are having to discuss between member states, but also with the European Commission on the question, what is the expectation to collaboration in research and technology development and innovation for the energy transition. What are the expectations? What does the RDI sector need to deliver to the energy transition? And I have tried to outline here this in three impact pathways that I find important. If you look in the middle of the picture, the impact pathway two, this is maybe something where most of our funding programs in the member states are very much concentrated on. How can we support our technology providers, our companies, by making them collaborate with research institutes and universities to develop and provide solutions for the new energy system? And how can we support them to become partners in the global value chains of these new technologies? That's a very important task for our RDI funding programs. Most of them are uh, funding um, research close to the market. But we also have to do other things. If you look on the pathway number one, then you see a successful transition of the European energy system. And here we strongly believe, and this is a core um, of the 
reasoning of the activities th that we are doing that given the big challenges that Ludwig has also pointed out at the beginning, we have to deliver something to transform the energy systems that means that not only funding projects and waiting for the outcomes in three, four, five years of these projects, but it means actively work, w working with these projects, actively um, sharing and developing knowledge that we can use in our policies and in our programs to speed up the energy transition in our countries and on the European level. Knowledge generation and the development of the knowledge community has become therefore one major initiative and task of our platform. We have developed a number of formats um, and we will discuss about them and we'll showcase them during the conference the next two days. Uh, one example was a big success where a new topic came up on the European level that was on energy communities, a very new format of collaborating for energy stakeholders. And here we could make a big contribution together with the European projects and our projects from the platform to deliver policy messages. What is important when we implement this new policy in our member states? With the impact network approach, we try to link our projects very closely to the need owners, particularly when we talk about integrated regional energy system. This is very important to link to the regional need owners. And we have also here developed interesting new formats. One of them is the validation network with the living labs. And we will hear more about this, I think, also from Yatta during this day and tomorrow. Um, and so um, I think we have been quite successful. You can find many of the outcomes and links to the different networks and initiatives on our website. Please make use of the resources and thank you to all the funding partners in our network that are carrying this, I think, important European in initiative that is contributing to the integration of energy technologies in a uh, integrated European uh, energy system. Thank you, Michael, for joining us and for sharing your view on our beloved JPP SES. I, I know that we put a stress on you when we told you only to talk 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, but still, maybe not everything has been said. And this is why we would really like to call upon Yatta. You have mentioned her. Yatta is uh, the lady that deals with the impact a lot uh, in, in, in the JPP SES and mainly in the, in the support team. Yatta Michal emphasized the need uh, to bring the research results to practice. Uh, how did you and how do you and how do you plan to do that in future? Yes, thank you and good morning everyone, Ludwig and, and Michal. Indeed, we have uh, done many things and we have been trying to be quite innovative in developing new mechanisms or concepts for for increasing the impact of all the activities of the program. And one example was already mentioned by Michael in his presentation, the validation network that, that is part of the impact network that we have created. And this validation network, uh, we have currently more than 70 members, 70 living labs and test beds from different countries in Europe and also out, outside Europe as part of the network. And the idea with that concept is to support the projects to, to sort of partner with these living labs and test beds to validate the technological or service innovations that they have developed together with customers. Um, maybe another other example of such a concept for impact uh, that I could mention here is the, the project pitching concept that we are going to implement for the first time tomorrow morning as part of the conference. So welcome everyone <laughs> to see what we do in practice. What you explained, Yata, and what you have explained, Michael, is, uh, I think, a pretty innovative <coughs> approach to RTDI. Uh, you, you out blind Michael, the three pathways, uh, JPPSS tries to cover all three of them. Uh, why are you confident uh, that you or we will succeed with these models of knowledge creation, impact generation, etc., etc.? Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. I mean, 
first of all i think it's 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 a need so i mean the 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 thing is i think that we simply see that we cannot go on as we have been doing the last 20 years i mean we we need to speed up the transition and i think on every le level we are active uh, in policy and in 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 the public public sector we have to do everything we can do to speed up and now the question is okay what can we uh, contribute and i think the living lab uh, example is a good example because what we saw is okay if we now start with our joint calls and we started already in 2015 on, and already there we uh, felt the pressure but now we feel it even more if we now start with our projects to establish living labs and to fund living labs that takes quite a while until they come up and they, they keep up running until they really really are able to deliver in mm. developing solutions but to opening up and this was an idea that came from one of the spanish living labs that was brought mm. up to to us they said look we could do much more because we have established our living lab we have a, f a field where we have a trusted base with customers and so forth um we could open up we could try to open up for other developers and that that was the idea and this is what the yeah. and the team is working on to work with these living labs on how it's a difficult task it's not easy i mean to open up a living lab for other developers mm -hmm. but it, it can sounds speed like up we, the initiative yeah it, it mm. sounds like we also would take risks if we wouldn't follow all the three passes yatta right what would be at risk if we don't do it the way we do it yes I think the biggest risk relates to the speed of development. So I think really uh, we would not be fast enough in, in putting the energy transition uh, in place in Europe uh, with respect to, and that of course has to do with uh, dealing with uh, the mitigation of climate change. So there we need speed definitely there, yeah. but I think it's also very relevant from the perspective of energy so self-sufficiency of Europe as uh, with the current situation it has become even more obvious that we need to also speed up the development there and then there is the co global competition for 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 in this field so for from all these three perspectives we need speed and that is why we are really really striving for impact in this program and in the end, mm -hmm. at the end probably it would also be the risk that we sink money when we need the money to be quick and good, right? Yes, and we might then actually invent the wheel again. So it's actually, that's why we are looking for these concepts, like Michael was explaining that, to, to connect with already existing players, not, not do everything many times and invest the same money many times. Thank you, Jatta. Thank you, Michael, for these first insights at the opening of the conference. Please, uh, please go to the backstage. We have someone else <laughs> to put on stage. Just uh, we invited a person, a keynote speaker, uh, who deals a lot with risks and the knowledge to overcome them. We have invited Dr. Pia Schweitzer, and I hope she has joined us. Yes, welcome, Pia. Uh, Pia is from the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies, IASS, in Berlin. Maybe you say some words on that institute. Uh, and why you deal so much with risks and the knowledge to overcome it. It's your turn, Pia. Welcome. Thank you very much, Ludwig. Yes, my name is Pia Johanna Schweitzer. I'm based at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam, actually, close to Berlin, but just close. So our research institute has the task to facilitate the sustainability transformation in various fields and domains. So my talk today is about the risks and the benefits associated with um, transformations, especially the energy transformation, and also how we could organize our knowledge co-production processes in a coherent, strategic, and more effective manner. So as we've seen, we live in an increasingly complex world where the consequences of human interventions in the environment and society are becoming ever more unpredictable. While technological innovations um, have um, undoubtedly benefits and brought about a societal change, they are also causing unforeseeable challenges and pose challenges to um, decision-making in society. 
So knowledge organization and co-production is uh, super is key is vital in the context of systemic risk. And our the first report major report that drew attention to the issue of systemic risk was this one by the OECD in 2003. And this report states that um, something that humans value that is very much close to their heart is at risk. And um, that these risks affect individuals, but they do not have an isolated impact on only specific societal domains, but that they spread, that they are much larger scale and that they spread across society through ripple effects. And those effects threaten what society depends on, vital systems, vital functionality, such as health, transportation, energy. So this is the context in which I would like you to think about systemic risk. Systemic risk is set apart from what you'd call like more traditional conventional risk uh, by a couple of properties or characteristics. So the complexity of interdependencies is one property. Another thing is uh, the ripple effects, the transboundary effects. So these kinds of risk, they spread not only geographically across regions, nations, even internationally, but they also spread across governance levels, across societal domains. And this is one of the key struggles for decision makers. Another thing is non-linearity. So that means that the causal link between like uh, cause and effect, this, this link in uh, for that is super vital for decision making is very hard to establish as there might be several causes for effects or one cause um, generates different effects. Another thing is tipping points and exponential growth. So here the challenge is anticipating when the curve becomes exponential, when there's this spike in uh, effect and anticipating this kind of tipping point um, that is very hard to do uh, because they are often a lack of uh, early warning signals that would point towards this, this bifurcation point. All of these previous characteristics point towards um, um, risk perception processes. They, they um, have an influence on how people, sort of citizens, but also stakeholders and decision makers, um, agency staff, frame um, systemic risk, how that they think about systemic risk, their mindsets, and all of this leads to societal processes that either attenuate or amp amplificate systemic risk. In most cases, it is an attenuation of systemic risk, which points towards, oh, well, we've got time, we can do this in the future, like um, the, like, um, we had the problem that the energy transition with the renewables was postponed in favor of more shorter term benefits um, still investing in fossil fuels. And this in some leads to a lack in poly as a lag time lag, sort of a lagging behind in decision making and policy making. So this, of course, is um, therefore a situation what has been termed as a wicked problem. Um, the influential, very seminal work by Riddle and Weber in 1973 um, described key challenges for planning and decision making. So wicked problems um, here, the problem is that we need to arrive at a decision because the stakes are very high there's a lot to lose, but there is no 
specific problem that we could identify. And there's also no stop to the, the dealing with the problem. So the, the decision making, the governance process is, is not finished, but it's rather an iterative process, which also ties into the challenge that there is no that there is not the only one optimal solution, but there's rather range of options. Some are slightly better than others, but none of those are really is really the optimum that everybody could agree on. And the other thing is that um, no matter what we do, all of our actions will be consequential. So, but the again, there's a time lag and the consequences will become apparent only over time and um, sort of even in with future generations. Now, this leads to the challenge of how can we draw lessons from our current practice? How can we aggregate uh, results? And this is, this is a key problem for, as we all know, for current research dealing with um, transitions also the energy transition, but that we still have no one size fix all uh, fits all solution for, but rather should uh, think about organizing knowledge, organizing uh, exchange and engagement. So that we bring in uh, various actors, that we can address the problems um, from different angles, because that is also another another key issue with wicked problems that they can be approached, they can be explained in multiple ways. It depends on your specific point of view, and also the the explanation, sort of the 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 rationale of the explanation, will depend on how on the framing of the of the initial problem. So this is basically the backdrop that we need to face, that we need to cope with when thinking about the organizing the energy transition, especially organizing knowledge creation, knowledge management for the energy transition. So here's an idea about approaching this, this challenge. First, there's, of course, analysis. And I think there's little doubt that we need to arrange, that we need to, um, you know, generate knowledge about what is going on, about technologies, about innovations, also societal effects. So here's a proposition. And this is an ideal type, you know, an abstraction. Definitely. So I'd say that um, while focusing on system one, sort of the risk emitting systems, whether they are biological or technological or societal, then we should also pay close attention to the interactive uh, interaction effects and the interdependencies with what I've here termed system two, that is the institutional arrangements and regulation, sort of risk regime, uh, regulatory regimes. Um, and then also system three, the societal controversies, the debate, the societal discourse. Now, those cannot be sort of um, picked apart easily, but they are always in the dependencies. And this is a key challenge, I'd say, for um, risk analysis, for any kind of research dealing with uh, the energy transformation. Therefore, um, the research that targets, especially this, this um, the boundaries between system one, two, three, and there might be even even more like on a, on a global scale, um, is is would be a key challenge for uh, future research, current research, future research. And targeting those boundaries um, that cannot be done in disciplinary silos or domains, but that calls for interdisciplinary and cross-sectoral cooperation. And also we should pay close attention to 
actor networks and decision landscapes. Sort of who is, uh, who and for, wi for which reason and with which uh, positions and stakes is in the driver's seat and who isn't. So how does that, um, how are these privileged positions um, spread over society? Who is uh, who is responsible for what, and um, who would who would be affected by which decisions? Now this makes things, of course, um, complex for analyses, and this is why we also need to think about processes. When we think about decision making and um, governance, a lot of criteria come to mind. So risk governance refers to basically the actions, processes, but also the traditions by which authority and decision making is uh, exercised, decisions are taken and implemented. And therefore, um, a couple of criteria, you've probably all heard some of those like reflection, iteration, but also adaptability and anticipation and transparency have been sort of posed out there as key for successful governance processes. And um, these six sort of iterative processes Remember, we are faced with wicked problems that have a basically no stopping rule that would decide, okay, now we are done with the problem, we fixed it, but it's rather an ongoing process. Therefore, also the, the process of knowledge generation, gathering, engaging with different uh, actors and stakeholders and the public um, needs to be organized in an iterative process. That would start with the pre-assessment that is the question of what is really the problem for whom, uh, based on which uh, presuppositions, and then goes on to the appraisal and the characterization and evaluation and then the management phase, but does not stop there. It goes on like with a revisiting of the initial framing of the question. And very much at the heart of this knowledge generation of this, um, process is um, participation, communication and constant reflection. So why is that key? Why would, why would we, us as researchers and who are experts in their fields, why would we be engaging with um, not only the industry, but also stakeholders like uh, civil society organizations, NGOs, even the public though. Why would we do that? There are basically three very basic arguments in favor of engagement, in favor of participation. One is substantive. That says that the outcome of the decision-making process will be increased with more information, different kinds of knowledges contribute, different kinds of information, all of them vital, all of them key for decision-making, thus enhancing the output of the decision-making process. The other one is a functional argument. It says, well, you know, if you bring in those who will be affected by the decision-making, by the, by the decisions and their implementation, then y there is a good chance uh, they will not sue you, they will not go to court, there will, no, there will be no delay in implementation. The other one, the final one, that's a normative argument. By sparking debate, by communicating about um, the the management um, decisions, by specific innovations, by engaging in societal dialogue in a two-way road, then we would spark a lively debate that is, that is essential for democratic decision-making, for deliberative processes, for a vital democracy. So substantive, functional, and normative arguments in favor of participation. Still, 
the problem remains how do we organize knowledge management and there are of course obstacles challenges first is i've just uh, mentioned the arguments in favor of engagement in favor of participation but how do we do that exactly in practice and then there's also the challenge about um, bringing in normativity uh, sort of potentially bias we will bring in the values and will views of stakeholders and people and collective actors and then also another thing is that we talked we talk a lot in these settings about case studies about specific labs real world labs for instance or other methods but how could we um, evaluate these very context specific interactions and processes how could we validate those and draw lessons from those uh, exper context specific experiences so that leads us to the question of how can we aggregate and draw generalizable lessons from very specific concrete processes and here's a suggestion so the publication by Lawrence and colleagues in 2002 proposes um, a, a framework how we could organize knowledge co-creation processes against this backdrop, against the backdrop of wicked problems, against the backdrop of transformations that are necessary to reach uh, a sustainable, more sustainable society, more sustainable a living environment. While there's no widely accepted framework or, you know, concrete framework or empirical strategy of how to carry out transdisciplinary processes, there is um, a general current uh, of transdisciplinarity that says that transdisciplinary processes, projects, prioritize the interface between science, society and technology in the contemporary world. So it is about solving real world problems with people in very blunt sort of straightforward terms. And the Lawrence and colleagues, they propose um, sort of different ways of thinking about knowledge and all of these need to come together for, um, for facilitating the energy transition. First is systems knowledge. Systems knowledge involves empirical and theoretical studies um, spanning the spectrum from very specific and a disciplinary understanding of a single phenomenon such as the energy transition to a more integrative and interdisciplinary perspective on complex relationships between these phenomena. Now, this is what we've, like what we would traditionally call, this is the hard science element. But on top of that, or in addition to rather, we need also orientation knowledge. And orientation knowledge that is about the formulation and justification of the goals and objectives of these uh, transformation processes that we propose. So here it is for the energy transition, it's quite clearly the uh, sustainability goals. So this is also has often been called target knowledge. Where do we want to, which, what's the aim and objective we want to reach? Um, sort of the target knowledge, the, the term is a bit problematic because it assumes that there is actually the solution to the problem. Whereas the orientation phrase rather indicates, well, you know, there's a general perspective, but there might be different roads to reach this specific, um, this specific aim. And we might actually not end up where, we, where we've aimed at at the beginning, but the general road is, um, is the one we want to go to. Then transformation knowledge. 
this is about understanding um, the the develop and the development of very practical um, means to reach these desired goals. So transformation knowledge is necessary to reach the our our general the it is necessary to to finalize our orientation. That might be technical, might be legal knowledge, also knowledge about the societal uh, the societal aspects and also the larger cultural aspects that are relevant to know about. And all of this is linked with process knowledge. And process knowledge consists about of the methodologies and procedures that we need to design and carry out projects for co-creation of um, transdisciplinary processes and these co-design, co-creation uh, processes. And here again, um, the question is, how can we organize dialogue and learning? There is, of course, no one size fits all answer, no one size fits all solution, but a rough yardstick, which says that it very much depends on the, on the challenge that we face. Often um, in issues that are related to the energy transition or other trans societal transitions, we deal with very complex risk issues. We also deal with uncertainty, oftentimes deep uncertainty, and then also societal debates, because they're sort of different um, societal groups and different stakeholder groups think differently about what is the optimal solution or the way towards reaching the optimal solution. So depending on the specific challenge and mind you, that specific challenge might change uh, depending on the specific stage of your project on specific or, or on the societal debate associated with a specific technology, whether knowledge about this technology has already reached the public at large or not. All of that might change over time. So you might move along on this axis of simple, complex, uncertain and ambiguous risk issues. But this sort of gives you a rough understanding or a yardstick for whom to engage with and what are the discourses, the types of participation we would, uh, we would um, start with. So for simple uh, risk issues, that that require an instrumental way of thinking about these problems, the regulators are, and agency staff are already well equipped to deal with that. It becomes interesting with complex risk issues where we need to think, uh, where we need to organize an epistemic discourse with um, um, experts, as well as the regulators. So this is what we often engage in, in academia anyway. We talk uh, and engage with um, agency staff, regulators, policy makers. But then for uncertain um, risk issues, here we engage with cons uh, stakeholder consultations to reflect about potential trade-offs. This is also something that we often do in the context, especially of the energy transition. So you might will all be familiar with that one. The other one, the participatory um, kind of, of dialogue. This is the most challenging part because that not only includes uh, stakeholders, but also um, the public Affect, affected citizens, directly affected citizens, or sort of randomly selected citizens as kind of a stand-in, a proxy for um, the public at large to deal with the normative underpinnings of um, the energy transition, to deal with uh, potential trade-offs and also 
bring in people's value, values, worldviews, and their general um, outlook on what's the society we want to live in. So this as sort of a general framework um, is a way of thinking about organizing dialogue and learning. But that still leaves us with um, several challenges for evidence-informed decision-making and innovation that meets societal demands in that sense that it is a furthering along or in, um, facilitating responsible innovation. So I'd like you to think um, about organizing knowledge processes, engagement processes as an iterative process. And um, then also diffuse knowledge diffusion. Uh, there is no classical stop rule where you'd say, okay, now I've done my job, um, but rather sort of think about the, the latency of uh, processes and impact. So it um, generates ripple effects. That leads us to the need for more holistic risk assessment frameworks that would then also integrate different forms of knowledge and map uncertainties, be transparent about uncertainties, as well as societal ambiguities and actively engage in mapping out those ambiguities. And then final point, um, we really need to bring in the values and needs and expectation of stakeholders and the public at large. And in order to do that, um, I've proposed the, the methodology um, that differentiates between systems knowledge, orientation knowledge, transformation knowledge, and process knowledge. Now, of course, each project um, that deals with the energy transition or specific as aspects of the energy transition might be rather strong on some of those points, and none of those would incorporate all of those uh, different forms of knowledge generation uh, at the same level, but still thinking about this integration would help us um, meet the demands of evidence-informed decision-making and responsible innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm very grateful, Pia, that, uh, how should I say, that was wind on the windmills of the JPP SCS knowledge community management. Thank you very much for giving your insights. We have heard now a lot about the risks and how to overcome the risks and maybe the existing crisis with uh, the right knowledge. I would be happy if we, you could stay with us, but you cannot. So I have to invite other people. And we have actually invited uh, quite some experts from uh, research, development, innovation, from member state level, from EC level, from policy, from industry, uh, from funding programs, from associations. They will come on stage uh, in the next hour and we will digest a bit what we had heard from Pia, what we feel like has to be done in terms of the three pathways that Michael has outlined. So please, uh, my guests, make, make yourself ready to come on stage while we are playing a little trailer. Yeah, welcome. My guests made it to the stage. Welcome to Michaela Williams. Uh, she is with uh, DGRTD of the European Commission, which is the research and innovation 
department. Uh, so you will shade light on knowledge, knowledge generation, sharing what knowledge is needed uh, with respect to the RTD in the commission. Welcome to Eric Leconte uh, from DG Energy. Eric, uh, you have been dealing a lot, not only, and we have seen questions in the chat, not only with energy in your life, you also dealt with a lot with mobility, I know. So maybe you can also build the bridges to the other domains uh, where we need transition soon. And we also have invited Venizelos F. Timio, uh, I hope Venizelos, I pronounce it correctly, from the Foss University of Cyprus. Uh, you will learn later why, why we invited Venizelos. But the first say should be with the two representatives from the European Commission. And I would say ladies first, Michaela, uh, we have heard a lot about knowledge, the knowledge needs, and, and I, I didn't dare to ask Pia who should be in the driver's chair, but most probably she would have said someone from policy. But what do you feel? Why is knowledge from RDI needed for policy making? Can you use the knowledge that people create in their projects, whether it be in Horizon, JPP, SES, or other aeronets? Um, good morning. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for JPP uh, Smart Energy Systems for inviting me to uh, uh, to this um, to this conference. Uh, happy to be uh, also with uh, with other colleagues around the virtual uh, table. Um, thank you, Ludwig, for the question. So, why is knowledge from uh, RD and I needed for policy making? Um, this knowledge, knowledge it is uh, needed because um, we have to we have to conduct a monitoring and evaluation of uh, research and innovation programs. We have to see to what extent um, the set objectives were um, were achieved, um, and also if the expected uh, impacts, for example, materialized or not. Uh, this knowledge is also necessary in order to uh, to build on previous actions when we um, when we draft uh, when a subsequent uh, um, work um, programs, for example. Okay, I mean, I, you you can step in, Eric. Please uh, share share the stage with with Michaela. Uh, what are the measures of the Commission? I mean, you you fund the JPPSES and others fund projects. They create a lot of results, insights, knowledge. How do you, from the Commission, get to that? What 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 are the measures? What are the, the means to get to the knowledge that has been created in the in the research activities? Yes. Uh, good, good morning, and I will compliment a bit. Uh, to what uh, Michaela already said. So input also for our energy policies, uh, because research innovations will show us what will be possible. And that helps us setting uh, new targets. For instance, mm -hmm. the, the targets for renewables. Uh, we could have never set them without a clear vision. What will be future in the possible? We all know that uh, in order to, to reach the climate neutrality, uh, we will need technologies and 50% of them are not yet mature and still to be further further developed. So very important for the input for our, our policies like energy system integration strategy, hydrogen strategy, renewables directive, energy efficiency, and also the uh, coming soon, the uh, digitalization of the energy yeah. action plan. So we really, received valuable inputs for developing those policies. And so to your question, what measures uh, we, we tackle? So of course now the, uh, res the management of the RNI projects from Horizon Europe is externalized to the executive agency, CINEA. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we, we have to better organize now the, the flow of information back to, to the commission. And this is what we do. In, in, a, in a structured and planned dialogue uh, with uh, with CINEA. CINEA is organizing uh, meetings of projects in, in clusters but, uh, so that they uh, exchange information among themselves, but also invite us, the colleagues, to 
uh, yeah. to participate in uh, that information. Also, Eric, the, Eric, you are you are also a link to the JPPSES and to the CTP to come. Uh, is is the INEA all also taking care of the results and knowledge that is created in on on this member state level initiatives? So uh, the, the 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 bridge. Uh, initiative that collects the results uh, from uh, Horizon Europe research uh, in in the field of uh, smart grid uh, technologies uh, of course is uh, open to the uh, uh, to, to, to the, the, the results of the projects of the uh, the, the aeronets the aeronets are, are part of the Horizon Europe as well okay. and uh, I think that uh, uh, more and more that there should be more exchange between those various uh, types of projects like the the aeronets and in the future the clean yeah. energy transition partnership where it's more led by the by the member states and so with the uh, a strong national dimension uh, and, and also the uh, ATIP has net uh, ATIP mm -hmm. smart network uh, as a role to play as indeed we are supporting them uh, with a service contract and they they have to organize well not only gather the the information yeah. on the roadmaps on implementation plans uh, priorities priorities for research innovation but also organizing regional workshops so going into the mm -hmm. the, the member states in the various regions of europe organizing the uh, workshops uh, where indeed uh, the national projects are, 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 are showcased, uh, but uh, I think that uh, also the, yeah. the maybe the your projects from the uh, SES, uh, Aeronet, uh, that are uh, that have demonstrations in in those regions uh, should be invited, uh, and also the Horizon Europe funded projects operating demonstrating in those uh, areas should be invited to have really uh, a better yeah. communication of results between the various strands of yeah. uh, research yeah. innovation. Eric, it, it looks like there are so many sources and so many pathways to collect the knowledge and uh, we happen to have a person who knows that by heart, Vinicelos. Uh, Vinicelos, in your Pantera project, uh, you have developed a platform called IRI, whatever it stands for, uh, to jointly manage data, information, knowledge from EC-funded projects. That was the task. What is the status of the IRI platform and what is it for? What are the plans? Good morning from my side as well. Uh, uh, thank you for having me here in this uh, interesting discussion that is uh, progressing. Um, we have uh, uh, indeed, the IRI platform uh, developed through the Pantera project. It is a, a platform that has to be developed in order to respond to your questions that you have asked to our, our partners here in the roundtable discussion, in the sense that we wanted, um, in order to help Europe to marshal all this scattered, scattered information, knowledge that is generated, valuably is generated throughout Europe, both at European level, but also national level. We have uh, put as an objective to, to develop IRI platform in order to uh, get everybody on, uh, uh, capable of accessing knowledge in an organized way. So IRI is here with us, is uh, helping us, and it is part of the process of putting everything together on one platform. It's ready, it's operational, is uh, uh, responding to IRI.eu, and uh, you can connect using your EU credentials. Vinicius, you, you said a big word. Everybody can go to the IRI. Who, who is everybody? Do you expect the, the very commissioner to go to the IRI? Well, is, uh, IRI uh, is targeted mainly to research and innovation community mm -hmm. because that's where we have made it functional in order to respond to their requirements in order to do their research work. But at the same time, 
is we are trying to develop, we have already developed a few tools, but we are aiming to, to develop further tools that will assist policymakers. What Eric said before, in, man, in marshalling knowledge, information, results, and how these mature the technologies forward is part of the process that we are incorporating already to help policy makers uh, to uh, address this issue. Uh, and uh, have ac ac access to uh, these results and uh, these technologies as they appear and they move forward and they mature and they give us information then this helps the process of quantifying where gaps requirements needs are in order to influence correctly the uh, the programs ahead mm -hmm. Michaela, Eric, I tell you a secret. I, I had been drinking quite some wine with Menicelos, uh, and we were talking a lot about uh, what what is knowledge. What, what do people really expect to find on the IRI? I mean, the IRI collects a lot of good information, but what is then tangible knowledge? We had that discussion, Menicelos. So I ask the representatives of the EC, what do you expect to get for policy? for policy making, not only for policy making in terms of creating the future funding programs of the Commission, but maybe also if you get a, a, a question from a commissioner, how shall we decide this, what should we put to legislation and so on, but what is it what you would expect to find on such a platform or from an output uh, of whatever type of program, may it be CETP, JPP or whatever, what is needed? If I can yeah. start. Um, so first of all, um, one positive element about uh, about the IRI, I think it's the fact that it connects several databases and platforms in one platform. And this is good because we have to avoid that we have uh, various projects all over Europe, each of them creating a database and uh, but there is no link between them and they are abandoned at a certain period of time hence they are um, they are useless um, so just if i can make another uh, remark concerning uh, airy i think such um, such platforms are um, very very important and useful for us to provide uh, up-to-date um, um, robust evidence so to say um, so not only for us, but also for um, stakeholders from other sectors, for example, um, to find uh, to find reliable information and to maybe to uh, to develop you know opportunities for uh, cross-sectorial uh, collaboration. Mm. So for for our uh, informed decisions at at EU level, so basically what we need are uh, robust facts and figures that allow us in the policy making process to uh, choose one option or the other. So basically to quantify the cost and benefit. So as we as we know, before um, before coming up with a legislative proposal, we do an impact assessment and this um, impact assessment <clears throat> it is about um, assessing uh, different different options in terms of cost and benefits and then choosing the one with the best ratio. It is not possible to do this if uh, we do not have a robust um, facts mm -hmm. and figures um, for, uh, for this exercise. You know, do I get it right? And uh, you said that this the IRI connects to various multiple databases, and I, I know that they connect to the databases of the JPP SCS because that's what we have been talking about, Venizelos. Uh, but now is the CTP to come, uh, Eric? I mean, JPP SCS will go on. Michael said that it will somehow feed into the the CT partnership, but. What would you expect in terms of knowledge generation and maybe also impact generation from the CTP? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So indeed, the uh, AREA, the, the European Interconnection for Research, Innovation uh, and Entrepreneurship, 
the, the, the platform is to be fed from other sources. Uh, and uh, concretely, uh, the, the service contract that we are supporting to in support of the uh, uh, European Technology Innovation Platform, SNET, ATIP SNET, and, and the bridge mm -hmm. uh, collecting results of the, from the, the projects, they, they are asked uh, in this service contract to collect the, the relevant project results. For instance, uh, uh, the, the key project deliverables, uh, use cases, tools, uh, methodologies, data analysis, uh, analytics, uh, visualizations, best practices, and then to feed them uh, in a suitable format into the area platform. That is to mm -hmm. avoid that uh, a project starts from scratch and doesn't build uh, on the results of, of the previous project. So that's may, mainly the, the aim of this, uh, of this uh, database. Now, when it comes to uh, knowledge uh, for, for informed decisions at EU policy level, uh, what we need is a, a contribution to, to foresight uh, uh, also uh, alerting about barriers, uh, not only technological, but also uh, market barriers uh, uh, that would prevent the, the deployment uh, and the development of our energy policies. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, when developing the solar strategy, uh, how to reinforce self-consumption, set goals, uh, uh, and, and interestingly, also the, the, the white papers and the position papers like uh, produced by the ATPSnet on key relevant topics, such as the uh, flexibility for resilience uh, that was co-authored with uh, ISGAN, so with uh, IEA, uh, and also another one, uh, smart sector integration towards an EU system of systems. So these are concrete examples yeah. of very valuable inputs for our policy. And how about how about uh, JPPSS? How do you value the policy briefs that we send you every year? How do you what, what do you expect from CTP in terms of knowledge generation, communication, intergovern governmental levels, and so on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, similarly, uh, bridge collecting the directly funded. Uh, EU projects, uh, JPP, SES collecting the, the, the results, uh, uh, also in synthesizing the same way as the, uh, the, the bridge with the uh, mm -hmm. working groups uh, on data management, regulatory business models, consumer and citizen engagement, those four working groups, they, they produce reports that synthesize the, the, yeah. the, the inputs from the project. So all the same. Uh, from JPP SES uh, and in the future from the uh, Clean Energy Transition Partnership. That is what we uh, hope for, uh, ex expect from you to, to feed into our policies. Now that we are talking so much about the CET partnership, maybe we should not only talk about it, but also visit. Uh, we have invited people that have been active in JPP SES already and now obviously are also uh, in the in the CTP, uh, uh, I would like to call three people uh, on stage uh, that have been actively helping to develop the uh, JPP and the entire CTP. First of all, I would call uh, Volker Schaffler. Uh, Volker Schaffler is the head of department for energy and environment technologies at the Austrian Ministry of Climate Action and Energy. So colleague of, of Michael Lübner and I call upon uh, Lisanne Brummelhus from the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate of the Netherlands. Welcome Lisanne. And I call upon Ivo Krustok from Estonia. Uh, he calls himself a green transition advisor in the government office of Estonia. It's a, that's a good name. But maybe first question again to, to Michaela. Uh, now that we are talking about European level, EC, uh, and now we have the representatives of the member states. Can research, development, innovation, and how can it help to overcome barriers between different governance levels? Or is there a barrier at all? 
Um, I think um, if we look at the if we look at the partnership landscape, for example, we have under Horizon Europe. This this shows uh, that already measures are in place in order to uh, to involve, let's say, the various governance level uh, levels in the process. So, for example, we have the involvement of member states in the states representative group of joint undertakings and of yeah. um, co-programmed. Uh, um, uh, partnerships. There are various. Um, there are various uh, memoranda of understanding uh, concluded between uh, institutionalized partnerships and uh, and regions, for example. Um, and um, we have also a um, um, topic in the um, uh, Horizon Europe work program. Um, in the wider, so widening the European research area uh, part. So we have a topic there on the program level uh, collaboration between member states, where it is about um, um, identifying common priorities between, you know, programs not only at national but also at at uh, regional level, um, in an attempt to. Um, to complement the approach we have in Horizon Europe, where we have upfront identified uh, partnerships and missions with a um, with, um, um, bottom up uh, collaborative approach at various involving various levels uh, to um, somehow continue the spirit in the spirit of uh, ERANET and joint programming uh, activities we had in past uh, we had in past um, um, uh, programs and also I yeah. think the uh, clean energy transition partnership a co-founded partnership it is also an example of how we can how we can involve various governance level uh, levels in uh, in research activities so value valued people from the member states uh, you have a hand from the commission uh, do you take it how do you take it uh, maybe everybody uh, is invited to give a short input as to what are the expectations to watch the CT partnership why have you been developing it what do you expect maybe you give a minute or two what how do you feel shall I say ladies first Lisan is that fair in that case <laughs> of course thank you Ludwig <laughs> and thanks also for the invitation um, my name is Lisanne Brumhuis I'm from the Netherlands and I work at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy at um, DG Climate and Energy in the Energy Innovation Team. And amongst other things, I work on international dossiers such as Mission Innovation and the plan. And unfortunately, not specifically on the Clean Energy Transition Partnership, um, as I'm replacing my colleague Ruben, who works on this important partnership. But of course, I know uh, mostly what it's about. Um, so your question was what the expectations are um, to watch this partnership. Um, well, in general, uh, for the Netherlands, international collaboration, also in the field of research and innovation, is very important. Um, as you all know, we are a relatively small uh, but open country, and our aim is to work together in various ways, uh, bilateral, within regional frameworks, uh, at the level of the European Union, but also yeah, beyond and globally. Uh, and we know and we have experienced that enabling Dutch companies and research institutes to work together internationally uh, will help us to reach our uh, climate and energy goals and our innovation goals. And besides that, the network around um, the Clean Energy Transition Partnership in itself is also very valuable. Uh, I think, yeah, we shouldn't underestimate um, or yeah, we, we, we can always learn from each other. Um, on how uh, different countries approach uh, certain challenges. So I think the fact yeah. that this also allows us to speak to each other is, uh, is important in itself as well. Um, yeah. When we prepared for this session, you had your little daughter on your arms. Yeah. It's going to yeah, be for yeah. her, right? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be for her. Exactly. <laughs> she's, uh, she's in the preschool now, so I have my hands yeah. free. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Volker. Uh, my why do you do that? You took the step together with Michael Hübner and some others to create this huge partnership. Why the hell do you do that? 
Thank you, Ludwig. Well, a very warm welcome from Austria. Uh, my name is Volker Schaffer. I'm the head of the department, as Ludwig said. And I, I have some experiences in, in doing joint calls myself as I've worked in ENSCC. And I know it's more like the, uh, the, 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 the battleship of RDI functions. So you need the, the black belt in RDI programming for coordinating and, and also participating in, in, so it, in such joint programming platform as well. But for Austria, it's really important to collaborate in the development of energy technologies. I mean, particularly for a country, for a small country like Austria, we are very interested in our innovative companies participate in the prospering global value chains. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the time the time yet isn't isn't as the world hundred years before were two uh, two inventors from from two different countries in, invented the tele the telephone by by himself. So we're in a we're together in a global valor and uh, RDI the innovation chain, heading up to new solutions for the energy transitions. And then I would say in some areas, Austrian companies are global technology leaders, as for instance, in the hydropower bioenergy, but the international ecosystem is becoming more and more diverse. And we expect uh, many technological areas mm. where Austrian companies could deliver specific parts and components. That's why it's so important. And the Threats National Calibration Project has been proven to be an important complementary format. And I have to say that in the ministry, we we needed a lot of communication that if you if you invest into energy funding in, 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 in energy programming, uh, it's not just on the national level because in, in most points the, the party is going on in, in the national level. So mm -hmm. uh, what we expect from the knowledge community and the, the impact network to act as the catalyzer to accelerate the energy transition in Europe is that in Austria we have developed an outstanding knowledge in building technology that where I came from uh, for more than 20 years, you know, from the passive house up to the to the plus energy districts. And in other areas, we can definitely learn a lot from other countries as, as we do with we go in a mission to, to visit Scandinavia or something uh, like that. Uh, so we strongly believe that in the possibility mm. to join the forces for the energy transition, we can we can gain a lot of knowledge and and bring it into in, to Austrian companies and it, to the to the administration. It, it helps. My understanding is it helps definitely a so-called small country like Austria uh, to make progress to not not stay alone. Is is that the case? Yeah, definitely. Because we're you know we're in most cases we're not the technology leader for the for for the for the big technology. So we're. We're just uh, 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 we, we just provide to the to the value at chains, and yeah. we have to get uh, we have to get sure that we that our economy uh, is as strong as it is in, in, in twenty or, or fifty years. So we have to do it now. We have to front, we have to collaborate now in, 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 in such networks and platforms. Yeah, we have yet yet another small country, Estonia, Ivo. Uh, what are the expectations of Estonia or your expectations towards such cooperation on member state level, member states with the EC and so on? Why are you in the CTP and the JPP SES? Yes, thank you very much for inviting me. And, and it's, it's um, quite easy to be, to be uh, uh, after, after uh, so many other good speakers because there's a lot that they said uh, that, that I, I very much agree with. And I, and I do see that you have uh, invited several uh, countries and, and all quite small uh, member states in, in, in the European Union. So I guess some, some of the things that, that we look at are quite similar. But what, I, what I'm looking at, at at the moment in terms of, of, of how the kind of joint energy research um, and, and kind of development goals are, are being set and, and how we are working towards them is, is that we have a huge benefit compared to what has come before. I think I, I was also quite active in, in um, during Horizon 2020 with the with the JPI water and climate JPI and, and other such kind of programming initiatives. And 
currently, I mean, we have um, from the European level, you know, we have the Green Deal and we have uh, an understanding of, of our kind of long term goals, both the, what we're looking for for 2050 and also what we're looking for more in, in a kind of a shorter term and understanding kind of from from the perspective of, of where we want to be and where we want to go is, is a much easier way to do this programming. So now, mm. I mean, we, there, there are things that, that have um, limited us in terms of, of where we're going. I mean, the, the energy crisis and, and the war in Ukraine is, is definitely something that, that makes things um, complicated. But I mean, you, you were talking about knowledge and information and, and, and the differences between these. I mean, we have known for a very long time that our energy systems need to change, that we need to do this transition. And we've had this knowledge that something needs to happen for a very long time. But I think now we really, I mean, due to the way that the world is, is currently working, we have the understanding of, of that, that we really need to do these things. And now we are, I think there's a lot of um, really good incentive between the European Commission, between the member states themselves and the research community of really now having very clear goals, you know, climate neutrality, yeah. um, you know, fixing the energy crisis and really the needs of how we want to do that because within the 30 year 30 year framework we really understand what technological changes need to be happening and i think this is why why the the clean energy transition partnership is so valuable the the pinpoints that have been set the, yeah. the goals that have been set are very well targeted towards the the 30 year timeline thanks for that evo uh, I, I check my clock here and i know that uh, michaela and uh, eric have to leave uh, at half past 10 sharp. So you shouldn't leave uh, before you have said a uh, final say to the member states. Uh, how do you support them? I know that uh, the CTP and the JPPSS get funds from the Commission, but what else can they expect from your side, Michaela, Eric? Yeah, yeah if I may. So indeed, uh, uh, as was rightly said, uh, a country on its own cannot develop all the presently uh, in the uh, energy uh, crisis we are looking at, at how to diversify our energy uh, uh, supplies uh, rely as little as possible on non-reliable imports uh, but uh, here we are discussing about RNI so it's a bit longer term medium long term yeah. and so your uh, your task is really not to turn the the resolved uh, uh, energy sources uh, dependency issue, uh, but rather to tackle the uh, the value chains of clean energy technologies. So really to build in EU uh, value chains that are not too much dependent on critical materials or critical technologies from the, the outside. So that's why indeed the uh, uh, working at, at the widest level, and the CTP is a very good example, and also the projects uh, at EU level where we want to have many uh, countries, uh, member states re represented, uh, but also looking not only at TSO level transmission, but also distribution, energy communities, uh, demonstrating in cities so that all the uh, the, 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 the levels of governments uh, are, are addressed uh, in, in our projects yeah. so that uh, it's really uh, uh, a complete mm. uh, value chain aspect that is uh, tackled here. Thank you. And from, from the RTD side, uh, Michaela, what, what are the plans to cooperate with the member states? Uh, you have been talking about workshops and so on, I don't know. Uh, yes, I think indeed uh, dissemination and communication, it, it is very important in order to make sure that we are also aware here about yeah. uh, activities taking place, uh, taking place in the member states um, on a more on a more uh, practical side for co-funded partnerships. We know that there are some uh, some operational issues that 
um, that are uh, important, uh, you know, transferring data uh, on projects and proposals um, to our to our databases. Here we had uh, we had some very good uh, um, opportunities to discuss, including uh, including a workshop. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would like uh, to to close by saying that um, here at DGRTD we also do the, you know, the monitoring of the partnerships to see to what extent they deliver um, on the criteria uh, framework and so on. And um, we are ready to, uh, so we uh, wish a lot of success to the new partnership. And of course, we hope that in the next biennial monitoring report on the performance of a European partnership, Maybe we will we will uh, showcase your partnership as a as a success story. Thank you, uh, Michaela, Eric, for joining us this morning. Uh, let me say goodbye and see you later. Last word from Vinicelos. Uh, Michaela said yeah. it. Uh, it's everything has to go on the IRI. How is IRI going to cooperate with the CETP platforms? One word from you. Either comment, yeah. wish, or whatever you want. Yeah, just quickly to say that uh, we have heard many words like cooperation, collaboration, uh, building on the results of others. Uh, ERI platform can offer this uh, capability of bringing everybody together under uh, one point access is going to be, let's say, a seamless connectivity and uh, through interoperable uh, ways of uh, bringing everybody and everything under the same one point uh, source of uh, uh, knowledge uh, to help countries to collaborate at country level, regional level, mm -hmm. uh, project level. It offers this flexibility and I think is a, a welcome place for countries to work through in order to meet their expectations. Thank you for coming, Vinicilos. See you soon Thank in you. Cyprus, I hope. Thank well, you. we have uh, some two more people waiting backstage here, uh, and I would like to invite them to come on stage to further discuss uh, the cooperation in the JPPSS and the CEP transnational worlds. Uh, I know and I hope that he is there. Uh, we have Paolo Partidario uh, from the research uh, on, on and renewables of the Portuguese Directorate General for Energy and Geology. Paolo, please join us. And we have Frederick Backman from the Swedish Energy Agency. Uh, Swedish Energy Agency also has a long tradition in inventing and implementing the joint programming platform SES. So, Frederick, join us, please. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you for okay. having me. Okay. I don't see Paolo, but maybe he will come later. Let's let's start. First of all, Frederick, what's your expectation? I had asked the others. What is the expectation of the Swedes towards the future of the JPP SCS and maybe the CTP? Well, uh, my focus is mainly in CTP, so uh, what I think Sweden wants out of it is a little what uh, Eric was uh, into that uh, we can't solve the energy transition just by looking at it from a national uh, level. We need to have an international cooperation. And I think CTP is an excellent uh, platform for this. Uh, if you look at how the uh, supply chains and the energy problem today, you can see that we have to solve it internationally. So I think our expectation from Sweden is that we will hopefully have a very nice and uh, good cooperation regarding uh, the mm -hmm. energy transition. Coming, coming back to this uh, shiny word of, of knowledge, we had heard a lot about what is it, <laughs> and some uh, one one has said there is a difference of information and knowledge. Frederick, did, did did you explain to me it once, or who was that? What's the difference of of information and knowledge? I I think well, that can be an answer that takes uh, several weeks, but uh, <laughs> uh, if you're going to make a short answer, I think that you should look at information as something that's uh, more of a uh, 
maybe like a, re a report or something you haven't uh, used your brain yet uh, and knowledge is, is uh, more of a cognitive uh, work uh, you take the information from a report and you analyze it and you internalize it and you use your experience your uh, uh, cultural background your uh, educational background and then it's turned into uh, a knowledge that is usable useful uh, something tangible uh, that yeah I, I would say that uh, knowledge is intangible i mean it's very difficult to uh, uh, transmit or disseminate uh, usually oh. before we go too much into philosophy mm -hmm. uh, maybe a question to to all of you guys uh, what type of knowledge we talk we talked about informed decisions. We need informed decisions in companies, in policy, in regulation, also in building funding programs. But what, what type of knowledge do we really need? What is it that we don't know and that we should create, develop, derive? I don't know who wants to answer or can answer that, but you all are building funding programs. You are very close to policy. What is really needed? I may answer to that, Ludwig. Good morning. Good morning. We have Paolo. I know. Paolo, I know I, that I you can answer exactly this question, but because we had been discussing that a lot. Welcome, Paolo. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you also for trusting me about all this. And uh, I, I will try to, to be clear. Uh, that I believe it's very important, not just about being a program manager, but to have a culture of systemic and uh, life cycle thinking. Uh, I, I believe all this knowledge that is being required within the challenges for the current um, energy transition, this is more complex than the, the, the transitions we had before. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, all the information that is needed requires all the time the, the connection between the dots. And to connect the dots, it's very important to have uh, also knowledge so I think there's a, a different a different set of uh, um, competences that are needed to address all this. I think it's important to have experts in different areas. I think it's very important to uh, put them talking with each other and sometimes to avoid uh, electing the driver just because he is a, a very, very... Uh, uh, knowledge people in, in a specific area. Sometimes it's very important to have people that have a more broader view and that can facilitate the process. So it sounds a bit like uh, we need the, the knowledge to manage knowledge <laughs> uh, yeah. and to take it uh, into practice. But what are the ideas of the others, Volker? Uh, what type of knowledge would you need? I mean, you're working in a ministry, you are close to policy. Yeah. Uh, what we need is to bring the different knowledge together because we've created, you know, after 15 years of uh, technology research programs, we have we've filled in a buffer of technologies and sometimes innovation that we're not, that we're unable to implement. And so I, I, I always say we have to lift the research side, the industry side, the policy side, uh, together uh, to create a new a new framework or, or to create uh, rules for a new framework in risk management sure. you you have uh, something like a motto it's called the turkey principle where the turkey uh, thinks that the farmer is the best friend until he gets cooked so you really have to prepare yourself uh, for what's what's behind the curtain and what's behind the curtain is something that we see now, you know, after 15 years where we where we invested into 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 gas as a as a as a as a as a, as a, as a gap technology, uh, we, we we need to grab out older solutions from research that we did 10 years ago, and I think it's it's really really crucial uh, to bring research and outcomes on a on a management level, for example. Uh, if you if you do research also in policy uh, also in industry uh, you need you need to know that that you're not working for new products you work to find your place into the value chain of tomorrow and if, if you work 
in a city administration or in a re regional uh, administration, you we have to bring it into a to a uh, to a management level to create together with industry and communities and so on uh, the the framework of tomorrow, and that's how it is. And, and so the, the the outcome must be more than the out the output of R and D project as such. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but you name it. I mean, we we need to convey the results. And uh, Frederick had explained a bit the difference of information and knowledge. We have to convey it to the right people. But will they listen? And what are the means and measures that we could use? I mean, in in JPPS, yes, we had invented the policy briefs. That is a very high level recommendation set that has always every year been created from from the poly, from the product results. We also have spotlights. But what else, or how can we communicate what we found, Frederick, Lisa? I, I, yeah, I think it's uh, important to uh, create some type of a, a melting pot with all the actors, so that they they come together. They, uh, so to speak, break down the barrier. I mean, it, JPSS platform and uh, reports and policy briefs and documents. It, it's all fine, and it's kind of like a, the basis. But then you need to have this uh, type of forum, I don't know how, but where you can give the actors the possibility to create their own knowledge. I, I think it's uh, very important to look at knowledge as a personal thing. It, mm -hmm. It's very often that you say organizational knowledge, but, but it, that becomes too abstract and often turns into a, a policy brief. Uh, I, I need. I think you need to come together and together, kind of grind down everything. That okay, I have a solution, but that creates a problem for you. Okay, how can we, how can we come together and and uh, solve this? I, I think. So that what, do you, is... what do you say? It's not only the written policy brief. S somebody had said knowledge is always between two ears. So yeah, <laughs> uh, and I, so I totally agree. You yeah. have to bring people together, right? Yeah, and have them experience the other side, so to speak. Uh, I mean, I have been involved with the energy efficiency networks, and, and uh, yeah. it, it's always uh, very easy to write, uh, write and read an energy audit report, but that's not knowledge. I mean, knowledge is when you stand inside the company's uh, process and, and look and actually see, okay, we can't move this machinery. Even though we will, uh, you know, gain a lot of uh, energy, but it, it weighs 40, 40 tons. I mean, we can't just move it for two days. That type of knowledge is very difficult to gain from a report. You need to experience it, so to speak. So before we go a bit more in that, and before I give the word to Lisan, let me give you some technical information. Uh, after closing this uh, discussion here, we have a session where we can uh, get some questions from our audience. You have two choices. Either you are on the conference platform somewhere on the right, there's a button that says chat. Or if you follow us in YouTube, you find the chat in YouTube. Whatever you find, let us know what uh, we should ask the panelists. Um, but Lisanne, yeah, how do you do that in the Netherlands? Well, How do you I get only... to the king and the queen and the parliament? Yeah, no, I only had one small addition to make, uh, a practical addition to what has already been said, which I completely agree with. And it's uh, quite, it's getting quite philosoph philosophical. How do you say that? Yes. Uh, indeed as well. But um, yeah, just a practical thing that I often experience. In order to be able to make informed decisions, it really helps if researchers are clear about the assumptions that they made um, so that we can actually compare studies with each other. We often see that uh, similar studies have different end results. And this helps, of course, for a policymaker if you want to turn your policy a certain way or another. But I don't think that's yeah necessarily the right thing to do. So I think it's important that um, the researchers are clear about the assumptions that they make so that we can actually compare different studies and based on that make um, informed decisions. Yeah, and besides that, I also think that it's um, uh, it helps if information is concise. And of course, the full analysis needs to be able uh, as background information when you have time to read it. But I also experienced myself that as a policymaker, um, we're often quite short on time. Um, so it really helps if 
um, the researchers and the scientists think carefully um, how, how they want to disseminate their uh, information and knowledge. So that's just a very practical uh, thing that I've experienced myself and uh, wanted to add to this uh, interesting discussion. Yeah. I mean, we have heard that it's not only creating documents, policy briefs, recommendations, etc. It had somehow to bring people together. I remember, Lisa, I don't know, 15 years ago, I have been invited to the Netherlands uh, to a think tank for creating the sustainability concept of the Netherlands or something. They had collected a reasonable number of experts, uh, people, housewomen, and the Queen. The Queen was there. At, at that time, it was still the Queen. Uh, is, is that a way forward to invite people from all types of stakeholder groups uh, to try and convey what we think should be done? Well, I think at least a valuable um, part of this is, I think people better understand each other if they work together. So from that perspective, it makes sense to put people together and to hear about the different perspectives. I think sometimes we can be in our own bubble and if we invite people from different bubbles, we can definitely learn from them, even though you might not expect as much from a housewife as from a scientist, but maybe Why not? Why yeah, not? That's what I mean, maybe you don't expect as much, but in the end, it could be very, very valuable to talk to the housewife as well. And uh, she might have some interesting observations that we could learn from. So, yeah, I, I think I'm not saying this is the way uh, forwards and that this won't solve any solution. But I do think it is important to invite people people uh, from different groups and with different perspectives. So I'm not surprised that you ended up in this session, <laughs> but uh, funny to hear. Uh, I mean, th that's the level. I How do you manage that on a national level, maybe? Uh, but Paolo, you, I mean, you have been involved a lot in European activities as well. I mean, what, what we do with the JPP, we, we try to connect to the EC level. Uh, Michaela talked about the bridge, the ETIP, uh, the set plan discussions and so on. C could we somehow contribute with RDI activities or platform, RDI platform managements to overcome barriers between different governance levels in Europe? Is that possible? So RDI as a means to the end of better cooperation in Europe, is that needed? Is it feasible? I think it's feasible. I think it's feasible, but it's, it's not a, a straightforward, you know. It's very much about the barriers you, you're facing in the process and the mechanisms you have, 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 have uh, uh, to uh, to, to use by them. Uh, I believe one issue, I was listening to you and I was thinking about it depends very much on the complexity of what you are addressing to. Um, because not just from the um, knowledge silos that you have uh, uh, when you're addressing specific issues that are uh, having different interfaces, but also from the policy area. You were mentioning about the, the policy briefs. It's, these are very powerful tools. But if we are just talking about one policy area, that's fine. When you're trying to address other policy areas, that depends a lot on the way these policy areas interconnect. So uh, the, the silos that you can have, the silo effects you can have, both on the knowledge side and also on the policy side, have to be well managed, very carefully managed. And I think there it's very important to have uh, a good problem definition to start with. It's like uh, uh, the, 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 the methodologies from the, the production design, where you starting with a very powerful problem definition, then you get, it's easier to get an effective uh, process and then uh, involving different people, different key actors to address the issue. I, I, I mean with that, for instance, an example on hydrogen. Hydrogen, if we are addressing hydrogen for decarbonization, we are in fact dealing with a lot of different people from the, a lot of different policy areas. And uh, yeah, and, and because of that, it really requires not just uh, deep knowledge on, of, on what we want, but how we can communicate to, to the different policy areas. The, the goals and the, the stimuli are different. So so it's the different policy layers, so from the commission yes. down to the municipality or whatever. But oh, yeah. And, let, let, and if you go, 
and if you go to the the, the, the layers from a, a, a special point of view, it's even more complex because yeah. you have a you have to make a bridge between the centralized and the regional approach. Maybe, but you also referred to the multiple dimensions. I'm I'm, I'm looking a bit uh, at the, at the chat, uh, taking a question from there. I I read you a question from Alan Whiteside, and he says. How do you link energy transition across stakeholders such as health, food, water management with distinct issues and opportunities to stimulate collaboration, integration, greater impact? So what, what Alan says, we need to not only solve the issue horizontally, vertically in the energy silo, but also link to the other silos. How, how can we do that? Uh, Ivo, you are nodding. Is, is, is that a task of your ministry? I mean, you, you said you are in sustainability, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we um, in the government office, I mean, it's, it's, it's natural for us to really try to look at these things in, in a very broad way. I mean, in, in terms of, of a change in the in, in, in kind of society, energy transition is a huge change. And we really do need to look at look at all the effects and the social effects and the health effects quite strongly. I can bring you an example of, of how we how we have have kind of looked at it uh, in Estonia. Our energy system is very much concentrated in in the northeast region, and when we're talking about uh, transitioning to renewable energy and moving away from from uh, fossil fuel production or fossil fuel energy production. I mean, there, th this has a huge effect on the people there from an employment perspective, um, and, and they can be quite worried about that. But from what was also brought out by, by the, the person who asked the question, kind of the health aspects, the environmental aspects that, that they see and that they, they kind of uh, interact with. So for us, I mean, the, the just transition process that, that was uh, built up in this region was very, very important because from one side, it allowed us to bring together uh, different actors, uh, like you said, I mean, from from the the uh, industry side, from from the local governance side, from the research side, but also what we had there was a youth climate assembly to to bring together young people who are not experts or or perhaps had never even talked about sustainability or climate goals before in their life, and these people were brought together and they were educated by researchers by, by these topics that we're discussing about today. What are the possibilities? What are the future technologies? What are the options that we can, we can use? And for them, this was a huge growing experience and, and the, the kind of results that we got from there was that they, they understand the issues. And if, if you, can, you, know, you can give them the information, you can give them the knowledge uh, that is coming out of all these pilot projects, yeah. all these studies, all these results that, that we're getting from how this affects their health, how this affects the society and employment, they will be very supportive and they will understand the needs. When, when you say they, I mean, was that public society or was that representatives, I don't know, municipal governments or industry? These were, or these were local young people from, from this region that is affected most by the transition. So they were selected randomly to be representative okay, yeah. of the young people there. I mean, you have been doing that. I have heard of that. We do something like that in Germany from time to time. But yeah. it, it's not easy to bring these people together, to manage these people. I mean, you said we educated them. I mean, how do you educate people when you talk about what's the difference of kilowatt hours and kilowatts? I don't know. Is, is that how do we do with that? Do, isn't there a need to also investigate how we manage such processes? There is definitely, and, and I really like the, the, uh, the speech that was made before the presentation made by Pia Johanna Schweitzer, because she really well kind of brought out the intricacies of, of these discussions and issues. We had a lot of help with this kind of uh, youth assembly. We had experts from, from research fields, not only researchers doing, dealing with energy systems or, or technological sides, but also researchers dealing with social change, anthropology, psychology, kind of help us to, to you know, bring this information forward. And I think these discussions that were had, where, where the young people could really ask any question that they wanted from these researchers, really helped both the research side and them to really understand. Maybe Wells would comment, but Volker, I have your, your colleague Michael has shown this 
<clears throat> triple level approach of, of the JPP SCS with technology market and adoption people. Uh, I mean, I understand that most of you uh, represent funding programs that do technology research mainly. But on the other hand side, I, I hear that it's not only the technology that we need. How, how do we bring that together? I mean, can, how can you fund development of such people, involvement, methodologies or whatever has been said? You need a really, really good support uh, structure. And you have to take it serious, you know. In, in former days, it was like it was like uh, uh, putting just money into technology research. And as I said before, uh, so we created a, a buffer of, of technologies and innovations that never never went to the market. And it's mm -hmm. I compare it sometimes a little bit to the uh, to to a to company where the sales and uh, marketing department is is as important as the product development department. Mm -hmm. So you can you you're able to to sell a very bad product if you have an, an, an high ambitious sales and marketing department, but it doesn't work the other way around. Uh, and it's a profession because when I was working in research, and this was my experience about uh, 10 years ago, it was like free, free engineers and, uh, and a, a regional planner who is going to do the, uh, the communication work package, the one who is not the researcher, uh, the, the, the engineer. But you have to take it serious. It's a it's a profession, you know. And you mm -hmm. you you lose you lose power on the street if you not if you not uh, uh, know who your target group is. And what we find out with all our support structures uh, next to the next to the funding programs is mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's not worth just to to put in money for uh, workshops and for dissemination activities and so on. Sometimes the higher impact is if you find <coughs> uh, operators, I mean, multipliers, find partnership, someone who, who also transmit your messages because this, yeah. is, this is really worth, you know, and you, and you just need to invest uh, very little of this time. We had been talking a bit about bringing people together. I, I remember someone told me that in Austria you had these, did you call it connectatons or something? You connect people <clears throat> to derive knowledge and communicate it to regulation, legislation. Have you been involved in that or is, is that what you are talking about? Uh, Creating bit, the structures bit, that do it. Yeah, it's a little bit equal since we're uh, one ministry. So we're also uh, responsible to, for applied research but also for energy policy yeah. and environmental policy. Uh, so we've brought the silos together in, in, in one building, but it was quite a challenge, you know, uh, start, start to understand what is their problem. You know, it's, it's, oh. a, different, it's a different question because they, they, they wanted to know uh, different specificers for heat pumps, for example, and our question was just, is it technically working? And that's not the question anymore. The question is, how can a market, how can a legal framework uh, be, be implemented that, uh, that makes the implementation of new technologies and uh, yeah. the, 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 the transponding energy transformation possible? And it's a totally different question. What has to be addressed? in relation to what we do in our fundings in the JPP in the in the CTP, right? Yeah, so it's definitely. not a, it's not a different planet. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not a different planet and we're under EU regulations. So for, yeah. for us, it's, it's crucial to participate in this in this partnership yeah. because we have a European uh, energy energy network and European competition uh, 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 laws. Did I see a hand from Paolo? Uh, I, I try to follow yeah. the picture here. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much, Ludwig. Uh, yeah, I, I was trying to follow this 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 uh, um, this main 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 uh, approach that uh, that you're talking about, and uh, I'm thinking about the the value perception uh, on all this issue. It's uh, about the, the 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 actors that are involved in the in the discussion, if they are in fact enough, or if it the the it should be widened the the, the scope of the group. And also their perception, their what, how they value, uh, what's on stake, because uh, it's something that uh, uh, when when uh, teaching uh, design for sustainability, I learned that from designers, mm -hmm. when they said, "Paulo, uh, just green doesn't sell." Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, we start digging on, on on the issue, and it's very much about the value each one um, identifies for himself or herself. Uh, so it's it's very much also from the policy point of view. It's also about what the people in their own compartment, the silo, uh, they value for their policy area. So uh, it's uh, it's an exercise that ne really needs a kind of uh, not just gap analysis, but also a common denominator uh, analysis. You, how does that sound to you? You 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 said you are an advisor for green transition. Now Paulo says green doesn't sell. <laughs> well, I mean that is true, and and that is something that that I also uh, try to bring out because I mean we're we're talking about huge changes in people's lives. And, and we, yeah. we can't take that at face value that just a better technology that is more green will sell. It, it has to also show them that it brings jobs, it brings other benefits, it brings, you know, something for them to, to uh, you know, better their life. I think that's, that's really, I mean, I think most people now in Europe understand that, that green is intrinsically better for their life, but they need to also see it from, from other dimensions. Well, yeah whatever green means but we are not going to discuss oh. that one uh, i would rather check a bit uh the chat where we receive some questions there, there was a question uh about living labs uh, i think it was yotta yusila who explained that a bit in her intervention but here someone says vladimir alexeyev says living labs take a lot of time to build true Maybe it's useful to interface to some digital innovation hubs, part of the Digital Europe program. I don't know exactly what he means, but uh, living labs is the real world out there. And some projects deal with real living labs. But I think he is right to establish a living lab as a pilot for whatever is not so easy. How, how can we speed up? Uh, I have a input there. I, I think it, he has an important uh, point there when he says it takes a lot of time. I, I think it's we need a, an organizational change among us from the national agencies. We we usually, when we look at the budget, uh, for example, in the CTP, we uh, focus mainly on okay, how much uh, financial support can we give to to the technology or the project. But we don't think so much about we need to add more to the budget in regards to how we can work with these issues. How can we create over time these living labs? I mean, they take time, they take money, they take resources. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisan was into this that maybe, you know, she doesn't have time or sometimes she doesn't have the time to, you know, go through everything. And, and especially if you're a national agency, you do a lot of things. But we need to kind of shift the whole mindset so, to say, okay, it, it needs to take time because there are people we are working with and, and it takes time to create networks or living labs and, and these need to be funded. And one problem is that, I mean, if you fund applications, you can always say, okay, we funded 21 applications. Everything is fine. You know, you can do evaluations and all this but a living lab it's very difficult to say that this was the outcome you know specific outcomes uh so i also think that that needs to be addressed as well that you can't just ah, in a year we're going to have two living labs fine Fred, Fred, frederick uh be a bit to be a bit provocative i mean you are right but who can help projects to do it will, will they get uh, support from you in monetary sense get the funds or get the knowledge from your ministry funding programs agencies they they do but i think we can give them much more uh, okay. in this sense so i think that's uh something we need to work very actively on could that be a task i mean we had been mentioning a lot uh, for jbp and the cetp and for horizon 
the, the support teams? Is that a task of the support teams? We had heard Yata, who does that a bit for the JPP SES. Should we, can we, as a support institution, help the projects to get that done? I think we can, but I also think it's an active choice we need to make. Lisanne from the Netherlands. I know the effort. you have a long tradition in stakeholder involvement. Um, yes, we do. But I think on the I'm, I'm not an expert on the subject of living lab, so I'm not sure if I have something like really valuable to add here. So um, yeah, I'm not sure what's yeah. the best way to do that. Had, had you ever come across this European network of the living labs? I I wonder if Yata is still around somewhere in backstage. She could she could come on stage if he, she wants to say something. But I know that Yata deals or dealt a lot with the European network of living labs, and I remember a discussion with them. So there are living labs that tested whatsoever, and now they are open to cooperate with testing energy topics. So building on existing labs rather than building new ones. Is, is, is that a choice in any experience from your side? From my side or? Yeah, you, you're everybody. And I think we, we really need to get Yatta involved in that. I know know that she, she is responsible in JPP for that. And, and I think she also answered in the, in the chat already. Guys, let's come to an end. Uh, there's more to come uh, after the coffee break. We will have a session on the National Stakeholder Coordination Group. Uh, whatever that is, uh, stay tuned. Uh, they are uh, responsible or at least want to coordinate activities between member states, between the member states and the Commission. Uh, but before we go to the coffee break, everybody can have a last say. What do you expect from JPP, SES, knowledge management? risk mitigation and so on. What should Michael Hübner take care of? Everybody has 30 seconds. <laughs> I can try. Uh, I, I think we should uh, develop a bit more our skills on facilitation. Who, whose skills on facilitation? My moderator's skills on facilitation, you mean? Uh, the team inside CTP should uh, uh, reflect about uh, that kind of uh, role, because we will really need we will really need facilitation efforts in dif in different areas in different uh, la layers in, okay. in the system. Well taken. Other wishes or recommendations to JPP SES? Don't tell me everything is fine. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I can. We want I to can improve. I can only support uh, Paula on this. I mean, I think the topics that have been have been chosen and, and the topics that are being focused on are, are are incredibly vital. And and I was talking to my colleagues in the ministry that that deals with with energy systems in Estonia, and they they definitely see a huge potential. But I think knowledge uh, knowledge management and and kind of finding the best ways to really bring uh, bring the the benefits and the impacts and and the the, the possibilities and the choices out i think it's it's uh, of, of, of uh, high value yeah i also agree i think for cetp at least uh, we need to work harder to uh, uh, support creation of knowledge among the actors that uh, are with us and also co-creation and how can we disseminate the results in an international uh, forum or way to work against the uh, towards the energy transition. Volker, what are you discussing with Michael Hübner over lunch? Uh, <laughs> take the CETP 
totally serious be more or less a catalyzer to accelerate the energy transition in, uh, in Europe. And everyone who is part of this partnership should be an ambassador for the knowledge community and the impact network. Thanks. Now we have ladies last, Lisanne. <laughs> yes, ladies last. Thank you. Well, I think final remark is, uh, I think it could be good if um, researchers and scientists who are going to work on the projects involve policymakers from the beginning, uh, so that it's, yeah, that we can make sure that at the end the results can be um, made best use of, um, so that the scientists understand how policy decisions are being made. And then uh, I think the results... Uh, can be used in an even better way. So Thank you, Lisanne. And say hello to your little and tell her we are taking care of her future. I will. Thank you so much. Thanks, <laughs> thanks to everybody uh, to having joined us, yeah. to giving your insights. Uh, we know that we will meet again at the latest uh, year from now in the next conference. But for the others, please enjoy your coffee break. Uh, be back at half past 11. Uh, for the next session on the National Stakeholder Coordination Group. Please take care. You have to go to another link, uh, but the platform will tell you. Thanks Thank you. and enjoy your Thank coffee. you very much. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.